As my title indicates, the general subject of my talk is the book known in Hebrew as the Torah and in English as the Pentateuch. It is known as such in English for the five parts into which it is traditionally divided. Its Hebrew name, the Torah, conveys something more substantive. It is sometimes translated as law or the law, and the word Torah is sometimes used in this sense in the Torah. However, the primary meaning of this word is not law, but rather taken from a root whose primary meaning is to guide or to teach. It is used in this sense in the Torah. It is, I'm sorry, it is used in this sense in the Torah. Its title thus might be translated as the teaching or the guide, or let me suggest the education. This observation has some bearing on how I think the Torah should be read. In discussing the Torah, I will focus on two stories or two groups of stories within it. The two groups of stories are as follows. The first group begins with the story of what the Torah refers to as God's creation of the heavens and the earth and all that they contain. It is a very grand and dramatic story, but this group also includes what happened to God's creation thereafter. It is also a dramatic story, but a distressing one. It describes the corruption of God's creation. The whole group begins with the first chapter of Genesis, Genesis, the first of the five parts of the Torah. It then continues to its 11th chapter. It more or less closes with a story of the building of a tower, the Tower of Babel. The second story is the story of a man initially called Abram and subsequently renamed Abraham. Most important is the specific story of God's engagement with this man. This begins more or less with the 12th chapter of Genesis and ends more or less with the 22nd chapter. Although these are of course but two of the stories the Torah tells, let me say that they are in my opinion the foundation for all what follow, of what follows them. As I will indicate the first of these stories, the story of creation, is the necessary foundation and framework for the whole of the Torah, but most immediately, the story of Abraham. The latter is the foundation and framework for the entire rest of the Torah. Now, given my announced title, ordinarily the proceeding might suffice as an introduction, and I should and would get down to my tasks. And so I will soon do. But I have used at least one term in my title that requires some further introductory remarks. That is my reference to the Torah as a book. This usage may seem hardly surprising, especially here at St. John's. According to St. John's and the syllabus for its seminar, the Torah is a book, indeed a great book, and I concur. And I would be happy to rely on the august authority of the curriculum committee of this college. And there are other august authorities, for example, the Jewish and Christian tradition, that agree that it is a book, a great book, albeit for reasons not necessarily identical to those of St. John's. Moreover, the Torah knows of books and uses this term. It describes an extended and discrete portion of Exodus as the book of the covenant. Laterally, in its final section, known as Deuteronomy, it speaks of the book of the Torah. It thus apparently knows of itself as a book. But is it a book? A book in a strict sense. About this, there is today some dispute, in fact, a vigorous dispute. There is another authority which denies and denies strongly that the Torah is a book in the proper sense of the term. The alternative authority to which I refer is constituted only constituted by many of the professional scholars of the Bible, perhaps the great majority of them. These deny that the Torah is a book. As this denial is well known and has important consequences, I thought I could not avoid some remarks about it. So what is the Torah according to them? It is a compilation. It is a compilation of several different documents Documents of both different characters, for example, some are narrative and some are legal. Documents of different provenance, for example, documents produced 
by different groups of Israelites or Jews who had both different interests and views and who lived in entirely different times. According to this view, these several and different documents were brought together at some time into the semblance of a book, but merely a semblance. I suppose just that they were put between two covers. As a result, the Torah lacks literary unity, and the substantive corollary is that it lacks a consistent perspective or teaching. This view became, first became relatively common in the 19th century. Since then, it has only grown in the number of its adher adherents, such that one might almost call it sacred doctrine. But it was first put forward explicitly and with great force in the 17th century by a great philosopher, known I'm sure to all of you here, by the name of Benedict Spinoza. Summing up a very lengthy and detailed discussion of the Torah, he offered the following very blunt and striking conclusion. Quote, all the precepts and stories in these books are related, that is told, indiscriminately and without order. These things have been collected and piled up indiscriminately. One translation is promiscuously. So that afterwards they might be more easily examined and put in their place. According to Spinoza, that afterwards never really came about. The Torah thus remained an incoherent mess. Contemporary academic biblical scholarship is essentially the elaboration of this assertion. Now it is not easy to disagree with the authority of Spinoza, let, all, let alone all his disciples, but I do. I consider the Torah a book. By this, I mean that it has a literary unity that derives from a unity of intention and that also expresses a unity of perspective and substance. substance. This, in my, in my opinion, is a unity that professional Bible scholars have insufficiently appreciated, if not overlooked altogether. Of course, I cannot hope that in the course of this evening, I will be able to elaborate this in view in full let alone demonstrate its propriety. Nor, of course, is that exactly my announced task. What, task. what I can do tonight is twofold. First, I can briefly describe what I understand to be the essential literary character of the Torah and its intention. And second, through my focus on the Torah's first two stories or groups of stories, I can offer illustrations of the literary mode of the Torah and its substantive implications, with considerable emphasis on the substance. So first, what is the essential literary character of the Torah? It is, in my opinion, that it is a story, a narrative, ultimately an epic narrative, that like any narrative describes events. Let me emphasize that, in my opinion, it is such an epic narrative as a whole, from its very beginning to its very end and throughout. It begins with an account of an event and ends with such an account. To be sure, the narrative character of the Torah is partially obvious in the fact that the Torah tells stories, many, many stories, many individual stories. It is less obvious because the Torah also contains large sections that present subjects that are not typically the material of stories. In particular, it has large sections devoted to the enumeration of laws. However, these sections should, in my opinion, also be regarded as stories, stories in an important, if unusual, sense. This is because these laws are not merely enumerated as, say, codes of law. Rather, they are presented within the context of their promulgation, that is, as events, the typical matter of stories. As such, they form part of the narrative or epic, and as a result, they cannot be fully understood without consideration of the narrative context. Finally, that all these stories, the typical and atypical, are linked together in a proper narrative that is continuous from beginning to end and also forms a whole, or at least nearly so. Thus, the immediate purpose of the story is to tell this story, this whole, in, this, this whole story, Insofar as this is the case, 
The interpretation of the Torah requires the interpretation of its story. And this necessarily requires the telling or retelling of its stories. This is what I will be mostly about this evening. So you're in for Bible stories. Of course, I will only be telling and interpreting two stories or two main groups of stories. But as I hope will become clear, these two, two stories serve to point to the fundamental character of the whole story and its ultimate trajectory. Alas, I must add that time will not permit me to do justice to even these two stories. But now let me begin, begin at the beginning, at the beginning of the Torah with its first and most fundamental story, the story of God's creation of the heavens and the earth and all that they contain. I will follow the, this discussion with a discussion of its continuation down to its end in chapter 11. As I will indicate, the whole of the story has a well-ordered structure and dramatic trajectory that makes it one whole story. The initial account of God's creation is presented very tersely in almost just one chapter, but it is meant to be formally comprehensive. To repeat is the story of God's creation of the heavens and the earth and all absolutely all that they contain. It is also presented in a most orderly fashion, day by day, describing the several parts of God's creation, that is the earth, the seas, the heavens, plants, and animals. The final part of God's creation is human beings. They are described as being images of God himself. As such, they seem to enjoy a particularly exalted place within God's creation. At all events, at the end of this account, God pronounced his view that his creation was, as a whole, very good or perfect. It was also now a completed whole. So much so was this the case that God rested from his labors in the form of a Sabbath, the first Sabbath. Thus, the end result of this account was that God had brought into being several different things or kinds of things that form parts of an ordered and complete whole the whole of what is sometimes termed the visible universe and that in other contexts might be termed as a cosmos. Let me add that the ordered character of this whole and the orderly way in which it came about is in strong contrast with many other ancient accounts of the origins of the world. These tend to designate chaos as the original starting point. But however that difference may be, what is most crucial is the Torah's assertion that the world as God first created it was perfect and whole. This assertion is crucial not only in its own right as a statement, but because, let me suggest, the whole rest of the story that the Torah tells has this as its premise, albeit in complicated ways. But I must immediately add that this is not the entirety of the Torah's account of creation and the meaning of perfection. In its second chapter, it adds to its account by elaborating more fully on one particular subject, the subject of human beings. This chapter and the story it tells, I have to observe, is often understood to be a second account of creation, different from, even at odds with the first account, and therewith contradictory, and therewith also the, the narrative is discontinuous. This seems to me to be a misunderstanding. Rather, it seems to me to be the case that the first account required and thus solicited this second account. It required it above all by the earlier assertion that human beings are an image of God. For such an assertion poses this question, in what way are human beings like God? And in what ways are they not? The second chapter offers an answer to this question. Here, let me limit myself to a way in which they are like God. They are above all beings who have speech, who can therefore understand or make the distinctions, make distinctions among the things that God has created and think about them. They can thereby also distinguish between themselves and other beings, especially the other animals. Thus, human beings are self-aware, intelligent, and knowing. But as we learn, 
as we also learn, initially their self-awareness and their knowledge were meant to be limited. Unlike God, they were not intended to possess knowledge of good and evil or good and bad. And so lacking in knowledge of good and evil were they, that despite being naked, they were unashamed of this condition. From this detail, it appears that knowledge of good and evil, at least for humanity, meant moral self-awareness or moral self-consciousness or concern with relative inferiority and relative superiority. At all events, while still in their original condition, the first man or Adam and his companion Eve enjoyed a most blessed condition. They enjoyed exceptionally easy material conditions in a wonderful garden, the Garden of Eden and they thus had a peaceful and happy existence. In addition, they were untroubled psychologically, at least by the sentiment of shame. They were not, one might say, divided within or against themselves. The peacefulness of this condition was the corollary of the peaceful order of creation as a whole, as originally described. But the stories that follow the account of creation present a much different and a much more unhappy story. The reason is that they are the story of the co corruption of creation, most especially the corruption of humanity. The theme of corruption is the abiding subject of the rest of this story down to its end in chapter 11. The manner in which the Torah tells this story is like its account of creation, highly structured. Among the features of this structure, is that it is divided into two parts, divided by the story of a flood, a great flood that nearly destroys God's creation altogether. Indeed, God himself brought this flood in response to the corruption of creation. Within this structure, the Torah, the Torah <coughs> excuse me, unfolds its story of corruption, how it came to pass, how God responded, and what its ultimate results were. For the present, I can only mention the high points, or rather, the low points. The first was that Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and thus acquired this knowledge. They became ashamed of their nakedness. This one must, must say seems fairly harmless, but it was hardly the end of the matter. Now possessed possessed of moral self-consciousness or the concern with relative superiority or inferiority, the human passions of vanity, envy, and resentment entered the human story. Indeed, they did so very rapidly with a great human crime. Cain, the first son of Adam and Eve, moved by such feelings, murdered his brother Abel. He compounded his crime by simply denying any responsibility for his brother. Cain's life, and thus his career in crime, was also, one should note, associated with his embrace of human artfulness. Cain was the first farmer. God attempted to restrain as well to punish Cain by ordering him to take up a life of wandering, a relatively artless way of life, and the way of life of his dead brother, who was a shepherd. But Cain ignored this command and in fact founded the first city, the foundation of the most settled ways of human ways of life. Bad as this was, things got worse. Subsequently, there were many men like Cain. One of them boasted of his superiority to Cain in committing crimes. According to the Torah, these, their activities ultimately filled the whole world with violence and injustice. Thus the dynamic of the Torah story moves from its very peaceful and what one might call its justly ordered conditions to an extreme of violence and injustice. To his regret, God concluded that this was unlikely to change, asserting, quote, that the inclinations of man's heart are evil all day long. So apparently hopeless was the situation that God's solution, so to speak, was to destroy human beings, and not only them, but the whole of the earth and all that it had contained with a great flood. In this fashion, the Torah ends the first part of the story of uh, corruption, but it also begins its second part, 
The fact that God destroyed the world with a flood is a crucial feature of the story, the Torah tells, and it's dynamic. God, we may be sure, had several weapons in his arsenal if he meant to affect the world's destruction. Indeed, he will deploy, deploy others in other circumstances later in the Torah. For example, he will use fire in his destruction of the evil city of Sodom. But the flood, the great flood, was unique in its effects. It was so massive that it covered the entirety of the surface of the earth. All of its features, including its highest mountains, were obscured. Thus, crucially, it returned the earth to its appearance at the time when first God began to create it. The Torah returns to its beginning. But by presenting the destruction of the earth in precisely this fashion, by returning it to its beginning, it suggests the possibility that the earth might begin again, might be reconstructed, or as one might say, be recreated. The Torah's narrative fulfills this suggestion through the story it goes on to tell. Of course, the main way in which this was fulfilled was the fact that in the end, God did not destroy all living beings, neither human beings nor beasts. He selected one man named Noah, a man said to be righteous in his generation, and caused him to build a vessel in which he could preserve himself, his family, and a multitude of animals. God, one might say, pulled his punches. But floating around in this vessel would hardly have amounted to a real and satisfactory restoration of God's original creation, for that required the restoration of the dry land, which was the original and appropriate home of humanity and the animals. And so God did through effecting the recession and the gathering of the flood's waters as he had done at the beginning. Indeed, the count of this recession and gathering is very lengthy and very orderly and, and uh, detailed, such as to emphasize this analogy. Thus the heavens and the earth and all that they contained were presented, are presented, as having been, so to speak, recreated. But given all that had gone before, one question was inevitable. Would the fate of the new creation be any better than the first? And if so, by how much? Above all, was there a prospect that humanity might even return to its original perfect condition? The condition that characterized it in the Garden of Eden. More generally, was there the prospect that the original perfection of creation as a whole was to be restored? The rest of this, the second part of the story of the fate of creation, is addressed to this question. In the end, it supplies a negative answer. It cannot be restored. It does so primarily, as always, by way of stories. The first story is an apparently incidental and odd story about Noah after the flood. But it addresses the Torah's implicit question in the following way. One might say that for the recreation, uh, if that is what had occurred, to effect a full return to the original creation, man would have to reacquire his indifference to being naked, to being unashamed at his nakedness, to being like Adam and Eve when first created. After all, their departure from that condition was the beginning of all the trouble. Remarkably enough, but as an indication of its narrative continuity, the Torah depicts Noah in this condition. He is naked and unashamed. But he was so because he got drunk. Once he became sober, his shame returned. So that condition cannot be restored. Moreover, this was the result of the fact that he took up a new occupation after the flood, the art of viniculture. Noah had become a farmer, the profession invented by Cain. Noah, it would seem, had become not perfect after the flood, but a bit more corrupt. This apparently incidental story is important in the two ways just mentioned. First, by indicating that the Torah is aware of the important question implicit in its account of the flood. Does this recreation offer the recovery of perfection? And second, in the negative answer, it supplies, at least at this point. 
Still, it is less grievous than the portrait of humanity that the Torah paints in the continuation of this story, and especially at its end. By that time, human beings had once again become very numerous, and their vanity had returned in full force. They gathered together to build a city and a tower, a tower whose top would be in the heavens. They built it with bricks that they made themselves, rather than with stone lying around. The purpose of this tower was that they would, quote, make for themselves a name, or thereby achieve honor or glory. It was not difficult for God to worry about where all this would end up. He could, of course, have had recourse once again to the remedy of a flood, but he had already committed himself not to do so. He had done so not out of concern for humanity, but for the rest of his creation. A new flood would have punished it as well as humanity. Uh, lovers of nature may take note of this preference of, on God's part. Still, he needed some remedy. In this case, he found it by confounding the common language human beings heretofore spoke. From this time forward, men would speak many different languages and would be unable to understand one another. And this division led to another, a division into different nations. These divisions did indeed offer some remedy, for as a result of them, the capacity of humanity to come together and combine to pursue evil would in the future be somewhat limited. Still, one must observe, observe that this was a sad remedy, sad in, in at least two uh, related respects. First, the division of language was a kind of corruption of that human char characteristic, man's capacity for language, that originally made him an image of God. And second, that it precluded the likelihood of potential peaceful comedy among them. The division of humanity into nations offered the prospect of continuing violent and unjust conflict among them, now conducted in their collective unions as nations. The Torah story is not slow in describing the fulfillment of this pros pro uh, prospect in the subsequent story of Abraham. At all events, it is with this account of the division of human language into many languages that the Torah's first story, the story of God's creation and its corruption, more or less ends. Let me observe, observe that in closing this way, it gives the beginning and end of this story a certain symmetry founded in the theme of language. The substance of symmetry has the literary effect of, divine, of defining this account as one whole, a completed whole. Of course, the account just given of the first stories that the Torah tells does not, of course, do sufficient justice to them. Above all, it does not do sufficient, sufficient justice to the details of their account of the character of humanity and the problem that humanity embodies. It is a rich, most interesting, and most oppressive account. I regret not doing a, a proper justice, but it was inevitable given the limits of our time. But I assume we can return to this later on in the Q&A. But it does suffice to describe the very orderly literary tra trajectory of these first stories and their substance, the original perfection of God's creation and its subsequent corruption, the possibility of a renewal of creation, the unfortunate return of corruption. It is thus a sad story, even a tragic one, also an apparently hopeless one. Had the Torah ended at this point, it would have remained a sad and tragic story, per perhaps not unlike many other ancient narratives or epics. But it does not end at this point. Rather, it goes on to tell another story, the story of Abraham. As I will indicate, this story will prove to be a somewhat more hopeful one, albeit in a very complicated way. And I'll also indicate this story, that this story comes as something of a surprise from a narrative point of view. But before leaving the Torah's first story, let me make one final observation. It is that even within the sad story of the aftermath of the flood, there is one detail that seems to point very faintly to the possibility of a more hopeful story. 
to telegraph, so to speak, a coming story. This is the fact that after the flood, God repeated his earlier jaundiced view of man's character, declaring once again that the inclination of man's hearts, men's hearts are evil. But he modified it by saying that this is so from man's youth. This is apparently only a slight modification, for on the basis of the prior account, it still seems likely that whatever men are like when they are young, they will still grow up to be monsters. Still, it offers a glimmer of hope, the hope that some men, or at least some man or other, might grow up differently, or at least be as an adult good rather than evil. In the event, according to the Torah, there proves to be such a man, uh, the man called initially Ab Abram and then Abraham. The whole rest of the Torah turns on, on the story of this man and the possibility for humanity that he opens up. But as I mentioned, this story is rather complicated, a testament to the care with which the Torah tells this story and all of its stories. Also the care it needs to tell uh, its story, given the problems of humanity and its many complications. Regrettably, as in, the, as in the case of the story of creation, our time will not suffice to permit me to do, do justice to these complications. Rather, I will have to limit myself to some general observations about this story, including some of the several puzzles it presents. Still, I hope thereby to give at least some idea of the integrity of its storytelling and the integrity of the substance or the unity of the substance it is meant to convey. Let me start by again observing and stressing that in light of the preceding narrative, the story of Abraham begins more or less abruptly and therewith more or less surprisingly and uh, also surprising in other ways. On both counts, it thus might appear to violate good narrative order. It is more or less abrupt because the preceding narrative prepares in only a very limited way for the sudden appearance of this man, Abraham. It does so by providing a few facts about Abraham's family and his lineage. Among them are the following. The fact that his father was a man called Terach, who had two other sons, Nachor and Haran. Haran. Haran died early, but left a son, Lot, and two daughters. Nachor chose one of his nieces to be his wife. Abraham also had a wife named Sarai, later renamed Sarah, but she, we are informed, was barren. The original home of this family was a city in southern Mesopotamia. For some unstated reason, Terach decided to move his family from their home. They wound up in the city of Haran. After these very brief preliminaries, the main story of Abraham begins. It is primarily the story of God's particular engagement with this man. There are parts of the story that do not involve God's engagement. As I said, the story of God's engagement begins abruptly. The Torah simply reports that God began it by appearing to Abraham and giving him a command. It is also, as I said, more or less surprising. It is so because in moving to this story, it moves from the previous global plane of all of humanity to the plane of just one man and his family. It will stay with this story at much greater length than it lavished on any preceding man and his family. Indeed, the story of this man and his whole family, that is not only his, I'm speaking now of Abraham, not only his proximate descendants, his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, but his remote ones, known eventually as the children of Israel, provides the subject matter of the whole rest of the Torah's narrative. The abruptness and surprise of this new story raises several questions. How might this story, the story of just one man, be the natural continuation of the previous narrative, a narrative that was concerned with humanity as a whole, with the corruption of humanity as a whole, and the still unfulfilled search for a satisfactory rem remedy for that corruption, or a reform of humanity as a whole? Is it, in fact, the natural continuation of that narrative? Might it not be simply a completely new, different, and to put it bluntly, a rather parochial story. For example, a story 
for Israelites and by Israelites. By, uh, for Israelites about their ancestor Abraham. Might it simply be a story that was put together, quote, indiscriminately with the prior one, to use Spinoza's phrase. These are reasonable questions and apparently difficult ones, or rather would be, but for the fact that the Torah's narrative almost immediately declares that it has answers to these questions. It does so through its brief account of God's initial discourse with Abraham, beginning with his command to him. God commanded him as follows, quote, leave your land, your kinfolk, your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. God also offers him a, a promise if he should fulfill this command. He first tells him that, quote, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, end of quote. But he also tells Abram that he, Abraham, will be himself a blessing. Finally, he tells him that through this blessing, the blessing that Abraham will be, that is the blessing he will somehow embody, quote, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now in response to this discourse, Abraham promptly leaves Haran and heads for some, someplace God has yet to show him. This is a remarkable beginning to Abraham's story and makes a remarkable assertion and claim. In light of what went before, God's discourse is tantamount to saying that Abraham, Abraham will be, through the blessing he will embody, God's answer to the problem of human corruption. That is, he is somehow God's remedy for that corruption and the instrument for his reform. Hence, despite appearances, the Torah's narrative, uh, what I meant by moving from the global to the personal, the Torah's, um, the Torah's narrative has not simply left the global plane of its prior stories, nor has it left behind its earlier concerns. In this way, the Torah's narrative answers the questions the story of Abraham necessarily raises, and does so absolutely in the most appropriate place, at the beginning. Thus, it claims that the story of Abraham is the appropriate continuation of the story it means to tell. Still, the claim that it makes remains remarkable. How can just one man, Abraham, and the blessing he embodies satisfactorily address the problem of humanity? I'll consider this shortly, but let me say that the full elaboration of this claim, not to mention its vindication, will require the whole rest of the Torah. This, I may say provisionally, is the whole story the Torah wants to tell. Now at the beginning of Abraham's story, the Torah does not say what Abraham's blessing, the blessing he will embody, is. Nor does it indicate how Abraham understood what this blessing is, or even whether he cared. Nor does it indicate why God thought him fit to be such a blessing, and why he therefore decided to engage with him. Answers to these questions, if they exist, must emerge later on. At the beginning, all one can conclude and then only by implication is what the immediate meaning of this discourse was for Abraham. What blessing he now expected. That blessing was a child. For God promised him that he would be a great nation. But Abraham, Abraham as, we had, as we had already been informed, was childless as his wife was barren. Before he could become a great nation, he would first have to have a child. And so thus, this is in effect what God promised him. Although this is not stated explicitly here, later on Abraham will indicate that this is exactly how he understood the matter and what was most important to him at the time. Thereafter, the question of whether and how Abraham will come to have a child dominates the dramatic trajectory of the story, down to its very end through many twists and turns. Thus, the blessing of the child and the great nation is somewhat more prominent than the other blessing, the blessing he will be. Nevertheless, following Abraham's story as a whole, as well as looking at the results, it is relatively easy to see in what way Abraham might himself be a blessing and how that blessing was coordinate with the Torah's account of a curse, the curse of human corruption. God himself, 
will eventually give some explicit notion of this connection. In this, but here, uh, let me say that the preceding part of the Torah's narrative of its story of creation, creation's perfection, its corruption, had identified and stressed two great human vices. First, humanity's inclination to disobey God, an inclination that was initially express, expressed through his acquisition of the knowledge of good and evil. And second, the great injustice of human beings, the great injustice that they commit that, ar that had arisen through their acquisition of that knowledge. In the course of Abraham's story, the Torah presents a man in the person of Abraham who apparently embodies those virtues that are the very opposite of these vices, the virtues of obedience and justice, and who embodies them to an extraordinary degree. How so? With regard to obedience, the Torah presents Abraham as an apparently obedient man, both at the beginning, very beginning of God's engagement and at the very end. At the beginning, as noted, Abraham received a, common, a command and promptly fulfilled it, the command to leave Haran and go to a land God would show him. At the end, Abraham is presented as willing to fulfill another command, a rather famous and even notorious command, God's command to take a son whom he has finally acquired, his son Isaac, and sacrifice him at an unnamed place that God would show him. Only God's intervention prevented him from fulfilling this command. Let me note that in this way, as in the prior narrative, the beginning and end of Abraham's story or the engagement with God present a certain symmetry. As such, it gives this story the character of a completed whole. At all events, Abraham appears to be a man of obedience from beginning to end, the very model of the virtue of obedience. And as such a model, a potential solution to one part of the problem of humanity. Similarly, the Torah presents Abraham as a man of justice. It does so especially through one particular story, a story that offers a most spectacular display of his devotion to justice. This is the story of God's destruction of the evil city of Sodom. In it, Abraham engaged in a famous, a justly famous dialogue with God explicitly about justice. He was concerned that God meant to destroy all the citizens of Sodom and suggested that this might be unjust. For despite the wickedness of Sodom, no doubt about it, he thought it might contain at least some innocent or righteous men. In accord with this, he enunciated a fundamental principle of justice, that it is unjust to destroy the righteous with the wicked. He adheres to it throughout this dialogue and goes so far as to claim that God himself is bound by this principle. Quote, will the judge of the earth not do justice? Thus, through this dialogue, he reveals himself to be a man devoted to justice, and strictly so. Once again, Abraham may serve as a model. But this brief description in no way suffices to bring out the power of this story, its precision and importance. So let me dwell here on some of its details. The occasion for this dialogue was God's decision to let Abraham know that he intended to destroy Sodom. The Torah reports that God decided to so inform Abraham for the following reason. Quote, Shall I hide from him what I am ab about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Again, we have this claim. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. From this it appears that God's earlier decision to engage with Abraham was already due to God's concern with justice, perhaps especially justice, rather than his concern with obedience. At all events, the character of Abraham's devotion to justice is brought out in two ways by this story. One way is by an account of the city of Sodom and the character of its evil. The other is through the contrasting account of Abraham's behavior and his own goodness. As for the Sodomites, it is 
important to understand that their evil was not essentially the vice to which they have given their name, that is sodomy. Uh, though uh, uh, it was not beyond uh, their, their interest. Rather, it was their murderous hatred of all non-sodomites or strangers. In the story, it took the form of their desire to murder some strangers who had come to their city and found shelter and hospitality with a resident alien. As it happened, this alien was Abraham's nephew, Lot. The primary character of their evil as injustice um, injustice to strangers is brought out when Lot appealed to them to let the strangers be. They responded by saying, this man came here as an alien and now he presumes to be a judge. The Sodomites thus reject any authority for justice beyond their own community and will. They are thus entirely selfish, self-regarding, and therewith predatory with respect to all others. They were, and to some degree, remain the poster boys of injustice. Abraham's dialogue with God about justice offers a great contrast, beginning with the fact that he had previously welcomed these very same strangers into his home. And as previously noted, in his dialogue, he enunciates a fundamental principle of justice. But his full devotion to justice is expressed not simply through these pronouncements, but through the fact that his dialogue with God is not general and abstract, but includes and largely takes the form of a negotiation with God on behalf of Sodom. He initially opposes God's decision to destroy Sodom. This negotiation is ostensibly selfless or disinterested. After all, Abraham is not himself a sodomite. This negotiation proceeded in stages and thereby indicated, albeit quietly, just how disinterested Abraham was. Abraham began by asking God to spare the city if there were to be found 50 innocents among its citizens. And God assented. Thereafter, Abraham progressively reduced this number in several stages, only stopping at the number 10. God continues to assent. That he stops at 10 might be taken, probably has been taken, to have been a deficiency in Abraham's strict devotion to justice. Why did he not go into five or even one? But in my view, it in fact demonstrates the opposite. For one must take into account an important fact. Abraham, Abraham had within the city members of his own family, as mentioned, his nephew Lot, but also Lot's family. Together they numbered between six and eight. Had Abraham gone lower than 10, he might have been understood by God to be pleading on behalf of his own family and no longer really on behalf of the Sodomites. Indeed, the whole process of negotiation might have been understood as a means for providing cover for that goal. Abraham's procedure, that is stopping at 10, belies that. In this way, the whole of Abraham's behavior seems to reveal to him to be a just man, a perfectly just man. Thus, the Torah presents Abraham as both a just and an obedient man. And in the event that he is, it would appear that God had apparently found a man who is good rather than evil who thus embodies a, re a remedy for the vices of humanity, at least as a model for other men. One may add that in the case of justice, God had already suggested that he was not only a man who would embody this virtue, but who would somehow be a teacher of it, in the first instance to his children. But his children might pass on that teaching to theirs and ultimately to his remote descendants, the children of Israel, in that event, there might come into being a just nation. And in that event, the blessing that Abraham bodies might be, as God declared, a blessing for all the families and nations of the earth. In fact, the Torah will eventually describe the founding of a nation, and it will also raise explicitly the possibility that that nation may be a just one and have a kind of universal effect. At all events, this in the end purports to complete the whole story the Torah wants to tell. But there is, alas, a problem with these happy conclusions, beginning with Abraham. 
To put it bluntly, they are not so simply entirely supported by the story of Abu. The whole story, as the Torah tells it. That is, there is a problem with his virtues, both obedience and justice. The short of it is, Abraham was not always perfectly obedient, nor perfectly just. The problem with his obedience, or whether he was obedient, is brought out by contrasting those acts of obedience with which his story begins and ends. In the first circumstance, Abraham ful fulfills God's command to leave his family and home, but he was also promised a reward, the reward of having a child, a reward he will later describe as absolutely crucial to his life with God. This diminishes the quality of his obedience. It even raises the question of whether it was an act of obedience properly, so-called, in the first place. In contrast, his last act of obedience is genuinely so-called. It offers no reward for its fulfillment. He has offered no reward for, for its fulfillment. Quite the contrary, since he is asked to sacrifice the very child who is the fulfillment of God's original promise. This requires genuine obedience, certainly altogether different than that entailed in his original act. Evidently, there had, a, had occurred a great change in the character of Abraham's capacity for, obe for obedience from the beginning of his engagement with God to its end. Similar complications arise with respect to Abraham's other great virtue, the virtue of justice. For to put it bluntly, according to the whole story the Torah tells, Abraham was not always just. The most obvious examples were two occasions in which he told lies, indeed the same lie, the lie that Sarah was his sister rather than his wife. To be sure, he did not tell these lies idly, but in difficult circumstances, frightening circumstances, in which he found himself a lonely stranger in the country of others and subject to the power of their rulers, the Pharaoh of Egypt and Abimelech, the king of the Philistine city of Gerar. He was afraid that as Sarah was very beautiful, these rulers would kill him and take Sarah for themselves. Now these circumstances apparently mitigate Abram's vice on this, these occasions. Still, as is pointed out in the Torah on both occasions, especially in the second, had the truth about Sarah not come to light, both of these men would have been punished by God, and unjustly so, since they were innocent of evil intention. Abraham would have been the instrument of the punishment of the innocent, a violation of the very principle he enunciates in the story of Sodom. So notwithstanding Abraham's great display of justice on the eve of the destruction of Sodom, it too presupposes a change from his prior behavior. The net result may be des described as follows. Abraham was not always a man who embodied his ult ultimate virtues, but a man who acquired them. Now this would be a problem insofar as the blessing Abraham was meant to be, was meant to be consisted entirely as a model of virtue. But this problem is mitigated if we ask how Abraham acquired his virtues. The most obvious answer is through education, an education in which his teacher was God. The story of Abraham is then the story of that education. One may say that one sign of that education is that God changes his name from its original, Abram to Abraham. We might also say that in presenting this education, the story of Abraham enhances the blessing he may be. For if Abraham was so educated, so might other men. To my regret, I cannot now describe the full character of that education, for it runs literally throughout his story, literally from beginning to end. Its ultimate end is, of course, the story of the binding of Isaac for sacrifice. At this point, Abraham had manifestly become a man of obedience. Let me also suggest that some details of this event also suggest that he had by be also become most fully a just man, even more fully than he was at the time of the destruction of Sodom. Indeed, it may be the case that according to the Torah, 
at the highest level, these two virtues are somehow intertwined and unified. At all, event, all events, God's education of Abraham was a success. At its end, Abraham embodied the blessing he might be, a blessing for all families and nations of the earth. The Torah could and now does go, now go forward to describe how that blessing may be affected, and may affected more widely. It does so by telling more stories, including the story of God's founding of a nation, the nation of Israel. But that is another story and a rather long one. In closing, let me candidly admit that my account of Abram has not answered or even addressed many additional questions and puzzles that it attended. It does not even answer some questions and puzzles that go back to its beginning. God was, of course, ultimately successful. God's education of Abraham was successful. But why did he select Abraham at the beginning? No doubt, given God's powers, he could have had some idea of that great capacity for nobility that Abraham eventually displays. Still, God's engagement with Abraham lasted at least 25 years. Might not God have found a shorter and easier route to his goals? Or were there other reasons that made God select Abraham for his project of reform? From the other side, and similarly, one might ask why Abraham accepted engagement with God and persisted in it for so long. At several points in the story, he expresses some weariness and even bewilderment about what God is about. In fact, at one point he despairs altogether of seeing the fulfillment of God's promise and accuses God of injustice. I regret that in my remarks I was unable to address these important questions and other besides, others besides. But I have some prior experience of lectures at St. John's, as David indicated, and some prior experience of the Q&A that follows them. So I have more than a fair suspicion that you will raise them. Let me then close here by thanking you for your attention. <laughs>